Good afternoon. Uh, I'm George Rudice from the Department of Modern Languages and also from Latin American Studies. Uh, and we're going to have a session now with the three keynote speakers, Dipesh Chakrabarti, Mabel Moraña, and Erna Broadbear. I would like to begin by saying how much I enjoyed the talks uh, and what's also good in terms of making some comments and uh, formulating questions from those comments is that they were very different. They involved different scale, different scale of how one can look at uh, questions of culture, history, agency, uh, and also different methodologies. Well, let me begin by talking about the question of scale. I would, it seems to me that if I had to categorize the talks and the projects in terms of scale, I would say that Mabel Moraña's talk involved a, a, what I would call a meso scale, uh, looking at the politics of culture. Uh, and uh, Erna's talk, a micro scale, that is interaction at a community local level involving performance interaction, the uh, interaction that works through the questions of memory. And uh, Dipesh, I would say that the, the question that he raised is at a macro level, that is the question of the global and the planetary, but also the concern about how to link that to what has always been the concern of history, or at least the, the process of creating history that's rooted to experience. So in a sense, it, it seemed to me that a concern was how do you link this, this macro that's outside of the realm of experience to what could be either the meso or the micro, because in a sense they both, both do involve questions of uh, experience and agency. Well, having said that, let me begin just by saying a couple of things that, uh, about uh, Mabel's talk. I mean, not so much about the talk, but again, about the scale and the method. It seems to me that methodologically, the talk fits within what I would call a politics of culture, addressing questions of ideology, whether those are pitched at uh, the, the national level, which she addressed, and multiculturalism within that level, but also at the transnational level, when she made reference to uh, Huntington and the clash of civilizations, and uh, the implications of moving the politics of culture outside the national. What, what are the ways of addressing that? Uh, at the micro scale, what, uh, what I gathered is that it involved community interaction with the, I don't know if the right word would be, the agency of an intermediary who also may be from that community who brings in the, the, the uh, archival and documentary work to be then examined with the community and in the process constructing uh, memory and from that basis if it went that far an alternative history but uh, it is, uh, a, a involves an, a notion of agency, which is at, at this level, which is somewhat different than the meso level that I was looking at, the politics of culture in, in Mabel's talk. And then moving on to uh, Depeche's talk, which posits this realm that's, that scientists have been able to formulate, right? Uh, and explaining that, that it is outside of the realm of experience. And so I thought, well, what would I label if I wanted to talk about her, the politics of culture, and hear questions of construction of memory through interaction and performance? Ironically, I ended up categorizing Depeche's talk in the realm of aesthetics. Now, why? Um, as I was thinking about that, that opposition, and the attempt to bridge the binaries. I kept on thinking of Kant and the transcendental aesthetic. That is the transcendental object, that which is, the, which is a construction of mind, of theory, right, on the one hand, which is outside the realm of experience, and on the other hand, the phenomenal, which is what does involve experience. And uh, interestingly there, right, what 
in the third critique becomes the bridge between those, or at least the ground of the possibility of knowledge, is the aesthetic. It is either through the uh, aesthetic of beauty or particularly the aesthetic of the sublime, right, becomes that bridge. Now, if in the remarks I made before, we live in an age of the expediency of culture, not only of culture, but of art itself that has become resource, then to what degree can one appeal to this particular move to bridge the gap between that which is beyond experience and experience, uh, something other than art, perhaps, or other than aesthetics? And so I leave that as a question as to, in a sense for everyone here, that would be some kind of agency or some notion of agency. I mean, I think it's clear where the realm of agency is here in the interaction with the community and the construction of memory, where there's a politics of culture, as limiting as that might be, where for me, I, I think you also didn't have a clear connection to agency, where I'm, I'm a little bit more, um, where, where I have more difficulty conceptualizing the form that agency would take is in relationship to your talk. So I would like to just get reflections on that. Thank you. Okay, then. Um, one of the points I was trying to make is that, see, in Aristotle, agency has to do with just the capacity of A to move B. So agency is force. And what has happened in our thinking of agency is that we have, have to, we've come to think of agency as a figure of sovereignty. Whether, you know, when I say I have agency over myself or a community has agency over its own life, um, what has dominated our thinking is really struggle over sovereignty. So when you think of human rights and individuals' rights, <coughs> rights between nations, the question of colonialism, uh, the right to self-determination, these are all sort of di figuring sovereignty at different levels and different scales, right? And in some ways, I was saying that the question of agency in the language of scientists, human agency in the language of scientists, in when they try to explain climate change, goes back to the language of Aristotle. In other words, when they say human beings have become a geophysical force, um, they really go back to an older notion of agency. And in that notion of agency, human beings having become a geophysical force, um, that, that's not a sovereign figure of agency, right? And the lack of sovereignty can be seen in, in this proposition that, you know, initially, when people from India and China, political people, raised this question that the West, you know, the West has messed it up and the West should pay for it, cleaning up. Um, and therefore, the West is guilty. And there was some discussion by Peter Singer people, you know, who are, like the whole question of retrospective guilt and prospective guilt, that you know, China and India will be prospectively guilty and the West is retrospectively guilty. And one point that Amartya Sen made was to say that, and many others made it, they said, look, but they didn't know it. It was an unintended, so thinking through a Weberian notion of action, the argument was that the greenhouse effect was an unintended consequence of many human decisions. And therefore, how do you blame people for what was not intended? But then the problem is, if you accept the science, and if you accept that the science uh, has held together for 50 years, as some people claim, and that there is actually a denialism of different kinds, but also a denial industry, like there was to do with tobacco. Once you put denial into the picture, the consequence doesn't any longer remain unintended. Then what you have a kind of in engagement in the world if the, with the planet from which you simply can't disengage. So even when you cognitively know that your actions are having certain results, the, the structure of your involvement is such um, that you can't simply automatically disengage. So that even if it sort of logically follows from all our understanding that there should be degrowth, it's not an option that's practically available because of all the other things happening on other scales. You know, it might mean that some people become unemployed tomorrow, the economy shrinks. Other kinds of griefs and miseries will follow, right? So for all kinds, so that's the point I was making, that in other words, 
there's a new figuration of agency which is not on the model of sovereignty, you know, which, which calls on us to, to develop certain cultures of humility, certain geoethics, you might want to call it. You know, people talk about bioethics. So if you, if the whole uh, movement from being biological agents that human beings always were to being a geological agent might actually need a certain kind of move to what I'm calling geoethics. There have been utopian proposals by scientists, for instance, um, <coughs> by several scientists who actually put a proposal that irrespective of all our political differences, social differences, technological differences, there should be a contract that human beings sign with each other and kind of implicitly with the planet that they figured out seven, what they call seven planetary thresholds that we will not cross. You know, we might fight wars, but we'll have an agreement that there will not be, you know, more greenhouse gases emitted than this. I mean, it won't happen, right? So in a way, what climate change makes you think about is really this other kind of agency which involves the subline, because that kind of geological agency uh, has a kind of sublimity about it. It's, it, and there's a, in a sense, we've become awesome, <laughs> too awesome <laughs> for our own good. But at the same time, we know that you know, it's, there's no voluntarism here. Just be simply because you know doesn't mean that uh, you're automatically going to disengage. So, so what I was talking about was that, in, that the two things. I was saying that, OK, there's a new figuration of agency. And that second point uh, goes back to the question of disciplines. So you know, it also means that if, for instance, uh, human beings are going to act knowledgeably, uh, about the environmental crisis, it actually means that the future citizens would have to read about the world in an interdisciplinary way. In other words, they'll have to borrow insights from many disciplines. Whereas until now, you know, historians have their own insights, anthropologists have their own insights, literary critics have their own insights. And we carry on as though things are not being said in other 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 disciplines. You know, so the so the so the disciplinary cutting up of the world, which actually once worked very well for governmentality, for the the governing institutions, right? So when it comes to family planning and crime, the government might hire sociologists. Uh, you know, when it comes to comes to understanding people's motivation for not using family planning uh, stuff in India, for instance, they might employ anthropologists. Uh, so the government, you know, basically we, we thought that the scales are different and the cutting up of the world by disciplines will work. And it seems to me that if there is going to be a solution which is sort of bottom up and not imposed from on high uh, about, our, about human futures, it would actually require us to think along many, <laughs> along across scales, uh, through different disciplines, uh, which is not an argument for giving up disciplines, but it's an argument for uh, the nature of education changing somewhat, right? Well, I think disciplines have their own values. So that's just the first response uh, to what you were saying. Now, now that I understand better what your argument was, um, that one would still need to be involved at the level of the politics of culture. Um, it, because I'm just thinking of one country that has well, there's two countries that are well known for having become environmentally conscious, New Zealand and Costa Rica, where their entire economies shifted around towards that. But that takes the kind of, I mean, Mabel was talking more about uh, the politics of culture in the sense of identity politics, so on and so forth, and, and the clash of cultures. But in the case of Costa Rica and New Zealand, what happened is that there was the kind of work that Gramsci talked about through all the institutions.